appreciative that you have included us in your morning, this absolutely gorgeous morning, through the technology of live streaming or perhaps Zoom. We're very grateful. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Dusty Ripplemeyer. I happen to be and have the privilege of being the senior minister of this amazing community, the Triangle Center for Spiritual Living. We are part of a larger organization called Centers for Spiritual Living, and we're located all over the world. We believe that there is one spirit, one God, one life, one love, one mind, and that we are connected to it in ways that can never be broken, that it is within us and that we are swimming within it. We believe that it is creative and that because we are created in its image and likeness, we too are creative, that we actually create the experiences of our lives, which may show up as the good news or perhaps the not so good news, but the good news is always that whatever we have created, we are the ones that can recreate it if we wish to change something within our lives. And so we're very grateful that you're, you're with us today. We have a, a wonderful day planned for you. And I would like to start with uh, a couple of announcements. And the first is a COVID-19 announcement. So I guess uh, technically we are in the middle of phase one. Uh, we, uh, as uh, uh, organizations of worship are allowed to meet in groups of 10 or less, which we are doing today with a crew of six of us. And, uh, and we are practicing social distancing. Now, phase two, we could meet in groups of 50 or less. Again, we would have to be practicing social distancing. And uh, Governor Cooper said that North Carolina would not be ready until May 22nd to do that. But yet that is not for certain yet either. So we are, as, uh, as a center, as an organization, just really paying attention to everything, all of the information that can comes out. Uh, we are, we have gathered as a leadership council through Zoom and are working on a reconvening plan, what that's going to look like, what we are ensuring that we will do to make sure that everyone is safe, and what we will be asking of all of you at the time that uh, Governor Cooper uh, opens that up for us to do. Uh, we are looking at all of the science and the data, as I said, and most importantly, we are taking it to prayer. We are looking within and allowing our inner wisdom to inform us of what is the right and perfect thing for our community to do. And I will tell you that myself and the Leadership Council um, are always going to be erring on the side of safety as it uh, concerns all of our community and any guests that may, we might have. We will be sending out, and you can begin to start to look for it in a week or so, uh, a survey, a survey that um, will ask you to inform us what you think you will be uh, willing and able and uh, wanting to do um, as far as this reconvening um, and how we do it and what you are willing to do. So you can uh, look for the constant contact. It'll probably have a uh, survey link in the, uh, in the subject line. And then if you fill out that survey for us, then we will be able to know what the majority of the community wants to do. The second announcement is that beginning today, we will be doing two financial updates each, mo each month. So two of them. One will happen on the first Sunday of the month, and the other will happen on the third Sunday of the month, which happens to be today. Now, since uh, we didn't do this the first Sunday of the month, um, I will tell you that what we will typically talk about on the first Sunday of the month is our monthly expenses and the revenue for the prior month. So, for example, if we were to look at our average um, expenses for the month, we take our budgeted expenses for the entire year and we do divide it by 12. Now, that is roughly about $15,000. In April, 
our revenue was $20,557. So we are indeed truly prosperous, and I am very grateful for everyone in the community, for all of the generous offering, for a few larger donations that we received uh, during the month of April but just uh, really grateful for everyone's willingness to financially support and, uh, this our community. Uh, on the third Sunday of the month, we will again talk about the expenses and where we are mid-month in meeting them. So again, the monthly expenses are roughly $15,000, and our revenue so far after two Sundays and a couple of weeks uh, is $6,280. So that's where we are sitting right now mid-month. <clears throat> this is um, really in, in response to our wanting to be really um, totally transparent with the community and letting you know about uh, our prosperity on um, a monthly basis. So we will be doing this from now on two times a month. Uh, the third thing that I just want to talk about is that we are looking for new opportunities to play with each other through this uh, technology. I'm looking at another dance party. This time um, we'll fix the operator air that, that allowed the mo volume on the music to be kind of soft. Uh, I know what I did wrong, and I can fix that for the next time, so everybody be on the lookout for another dance party. We will also be doing Lunch Bunch again the first Sunday in June, so probably about 12.15 or so, maybe 10 minutes after we finish the service, then we will begin uh, to do Lunch Bunch through Zoom, and again, the links will be sent out to you. We're looking at the possibilities of doing a game night, and we're also looking at the possibilities of a bingo night. So uh, we will get those out uh, on constant contact, let you know uh, what uh, the dates will be and how to access them through, through June. So uh, we know that everybody misses everybody and uh, loves everybody and loves to spend time with each other. So that is what we are planning on providing for everyone. In this moment, I would love to invite up our platform host of the day, licensed spiritual practitioner, Heather Abbott. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Our theme for 2020 is 2020 Spiritual Vision. Our May theme is Listen to Your Heart. Reverend Dusty's talk, talk title today is The Great Work of Your Life. Now I would like to read our community purpose statement. This is our reason for being here. Our purpose is to inspire, educate, and empower individuals to experience themselves as unique and individualized expressions of God, the love intelligence that governs the universe. We are committed to not merely a theoretical understanding of our oneness and unity with God, but to consciously practice this truth in our everyday lives. Through celebration, service, study, and fellowship, we are committed to the transformation of our personal lives and to being a powerful and beneficial presence on the planet. With the energy of unconditional love, simply, we are here for God. Now I invite you to participate in our centering, closing your outer eyes, and turn within allowing these healing sounds to wash over you.
As the last of the sounds reverberate through the cells of your body, I invite you to bring your attention back into your rooms and into your bodies and remain turned within as I speak a word of invocation upon our service. Blessing the service, blessing our time together, blessing Bruce and Heather back in the AV booth, Miles and Letha as they share their gift of music, Jim and Heather as practitioners serving this community with their generosity of spirit and their love. Blessing everyone on Facebook Live and everyone on Zoom, blessing everyone in our community, everyone on the planet, all of the first responders and the dedicated essential workers wherever they are, from hospital to truck to grocery store to factories and everywhere else, blessing the parents, the children, blessing us all. Truly the face of God is right where we are. The love, the peace, the joy, the creativity, the abundance, and the grace. We can never be separate from it. It is closer than our hands and feet, deeper than our very breath. And so from that place of unity, I absolutely know that our service flows with grace and with ease, that it is a divine appointment that God is having through and as each of us, individually and collectively. I know that it, that it contains within it wisdom, insight, revelation, that everything that needs to be heard is heard and everything that needs to be said is said. And so we simply allow it to unfold by saying, and so it is, and so it is, amen. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the podium licensed spiritual practitioner and minister, ministerial student, Mr. James Rigsby. Good morning. I add my welcome to those previous to mine, and I'm just happy to see you out there. Uh, it's time for the blessing of all faiths. Um, here we believe that there are that there is one God and many paths. So the Triangle Center for Spiritual Living honors the diversity and threads of truth that run through all spiritual paths as represented by this ceremony. Christianity is the path of Christ consciousness, love, and forgiveness. Buddhism is the path of pa compassion and understanding. Judaism is the ethical path of living by sacred law. Baha'i is the path of unity and peace. Islam is the path of submission to the will of God, the highest calling. Confucianism is the path of deliberate tradition. Taoism is the natural way, the path of ultimate reality. Native American practice and shamanic traditions are the paths of primal spirituality. Shintoism is the path of tribal ancestry. Hinduism is is the path of knowledge, action, and devotion. Science of mind and spirit is the path of the divine principle of love and law. And the heart represents the one heart, the one love that resides at the center of all people and all beings everywhere with no exceptions. May peace prevail on earth through the followers of all paths. And so it is. Today's reading is from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. It says, If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. 
If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And so it is. So if you'd like to join me by turning within, focusing on this now moment as I speak a word of invocation and blessing. Just grateful for this beautiful day, knowing that shining behind it is the spirit the one spirit, the one life, the one creative power in the universe. And knowing that I am one with it, that I can never be separate from it, I know the same is true for everyone within the sound of my voice, every sentient being in this universe. That we are all bound up in the one life of spirit, each as individualized, unique expressions of it. And so from this space of unity, I speak a word of blessing on Reverend Dusty today as she comes forward to share her gifts of inspiration, intelligence, and love, knowing that she allows spirit to speak through her as her, and it forever changes our hearts and our minds forever. And I speak a word of blessing on Miles and Letha as they come forward to share their gifts of song and music with us that shifts the vibration of our heart and forever changes us as well. So for these two wonderful uh, acts, I uh, give great thanks, and so it is. So without uh, any further ado, I welcome up Miles and Letha. Thank you so much. We look forward to singing with you today. Um, And I invite you to take this song as part of an inward journey. It's called Wading Deep Waters.
get home Well I'm climbing high mountains trying to get home Climbing high mountains I'm climbing high mountains Climbing high mountains trying to get home Trying to get home I'm waiting deep waters Waiting deep waters Waiting deep waters Trying to get home Trying to get home Thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful, perfect song for today. My talk title is The Great Work of Your Life. Over the next two Sundays, we are talking about our purpose, our vocation, our divine calling, that which we were created to be and to do, that which we are to bring out into the world. We will be doing this within the backdrop of a wonderful book by the same name, The Great Work of Your Life, written by Stephen Cope. Now, in his book, Stephen Cope weaves together personal narratives of ordinary and extraordinary lives within the backdrop of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, for those who may not be familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, it is a 700-verse Hindu scripture set in a narrative framework of a dialogue between Prince Arjuna and his guide and charioteer, Krishna. Now, it is the best known and the most famous of all uh, Hindu texts. Now, the setting of the Gita is in a battlefield and has been interpreted as an allegory for the uh, ethical and moral struggles of human life. Throughout the book, uh, Stephen Cope shares with us the secret keys of understanding and wisdom that is found within the Gita's sacred pages. Now, it presents an insightful look at our dharma, as explained by Krishna and, and Prince Arjuna, and how that insight can transform our actions into spiritual practice and can actually guide us to ultimate freedom and fulfillment. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with this word dharma, it's a Sanskrit word which means uh, path or teaching or law. The yogis are very interested in the idea of an inner possibility, an inner possibility that is harbored within every individual soul. They insist that every single human being has a unique vocation and that it is our duty to fully and completely embody it. Our greatest responsibility is to that inner possibility. Dharma is roughly translated as our sacred duty, our purpose, or how we are meant to realize our lives. It is, it is uh, really our essential nature and how we express that out into the world. As the Bhagavad Gita begins, our friend Prince Arjuna has collapsed onto the floor of his chariot. He is undone by 
doubts and conflicts that he faces within himself about his own actions, about his calling. Arjuna is supposed to be the greatest warrior of his time. And he's on this great battlefield which is about to be engaged, and yet here he is lying on the floor of his chariot, filled with every kind of fear that one can imagine. He's so paralyzed by doubt that he can't act. He's tried to live a good life. He's tried to live out his warrior dharma, dharma. But here, in this moment, the world has momentarily crushed him. He cries out, what am I really called to do in this circumstance? What, how, how can I act in such a way as to really fulfill my dharma? Now, while we might not be in this moment on a literal battlefield, we too have had moments in our lives, perhaps many moments in our lives, in which we have been where Prince Arjuna is, filled with fear, paralyzed by doubt, asking, am I living my life fully right now? Am I bringing forth everything that I can bring forth? Am I living my life's calling? Dharma. Not only did the yogis name this inner aspect of ourselves, but they also created a detailed, a detailed method of fulfilling it. This method is expounded upon within the Bhagavad Gita, this profound conversation between Prince Arjuna and Krishna. In it, Krishna teaches Arjuna how to embrace his sacred calling, his sacred vocation, his Dharma. Stephen Cope says, in fact, the Bhagavad Gita was written precisely to show us how to make the world of action, the marketplace, the workplace, the family, an arena for spiritual development. Indeed, it portrays the battlefield of life, real life, everyday life, as the most potent venue for transformation. So this path of action really expounded upon by Krishna has four main pillars. They are look to your dharma, do it full out, let go of the fruits, and turn it over to God. Now the first pillar, look to your dharma, is a call for introspection, a call for us to actually name our, uh, our dharma and to define it. The second pillar, do it full out, is all about doing it with our full effort, with our full spirit. The third pillar, let go of the fruits, reminds us to let go of the outcome, to not be attached to the results. And the final or fourth pillar, turn it over to God, is all ab about us having the faith that if we are living from our dharma, that the universe will align to assist us with that, and, and it will all turn out just fine. Now today we're looking at that first pillar, and next Sunday we will look at the other three. Before we go into that, however, let's return to Prince Arjuna laying there on the floor of his chariot. The Bhagavad Gita knows that many of us will identify with Prince Arjuna's dilemma. Many of us have been at similar crossroads in our lives. Perhaps some of us are even sitting at one of those crossroads right now. How do we choose between two difficult, possibly contrasting courses of action? What are the consequences of in inaction? And what are the consequences of uh, choosing poorly? Prince Arjuna is not so much afraid as he is immobilized by a web of doubt. We too have been, or perhaps are right now, paralyzed by doubt. Doubt as understood in this context really means stuck that it is a state of mind in uh, a state in which the mind is suspended between two contradictory propositions 
and unable to assent to either one of them. How often have we found ourselves paralyzed from action, unsure, split between uh, misgivings, straddling these, these two with a foot on one side of the dilemma and a foot on the other side, or a foot on one side of the challenge and a foot on the other side of the challenge. How often has that shown up for us? This doubt, the energy of being stuck, is an outward and visible sign of an inner struggle. The yoga tradition has called doubt the invisible affliction. Stephen Cope says, I know people who have been stuck in doubt their entire lifetime. Each of these unfortunate individuals, some of them my very own friends and family, came at some point to a crossroads. They came to this crossroads and found themselves rooted there with one foot firmly planted on each side of the intersection. Alas, they never moved off the dime. They procrastinated, dithered. Finally, they put a folding chair smack in the center of that crossroads and lived there for the rest of their lives. After a while, they forgot entirely that there even was a crossroads, forgot that there was a choice. Now, there's many ways in which doubt can keep us paralyzed. One way Stephen Cope calls is the fear of closing the door. Now, the way this plays out, for example, is when someone has actually been living their dharma, been living th from their purpose, but it has been lived out. And the, and the person only has a vague sense of what is to come next. The person becomes increasingly aware that um, in order to step into their next expression, their, their next highest yet to be, they will have to choose to close a door behind them in order for the door in front of them to open. They become increasingly aware that they are coming to the edge of a cliff where a leap of faith is required of them. <coughs> the, the question becomes, will they choose to make that leap of faith or will they set up a folding chair? Another way that doubt can keep us paralyzed is what Stephen Cope calls the denial of dharma. <coughs> Excuse me. He talks about a woman named Ellen. Perhaps as you're sitting there listening, you might hear or, or see a little bit of yourself in Ellen's story. Excuse me. Ellen is the head nurse in a psychiatric uh, hospital in a VA or a psychiatric unit in a VA hospital. She's knowledgeable. She's professional. She's masterful. She loves to support people and loves, absolutely loves to be of service, not only at work, but also with her friends and, and with um, her family and the community that she lives within. Ellen is an angel for so many people. She's highly respected and even loved for who she is and what she does, although she will tell you that she's just an ordinary, regular worker bee. She lives with the sense that she does not have a calling, simply because she believes that who she is and what she does is not dramatic enough to be considered a calling. What she doesn't see is that her dharma work is everywhere. It saturates her entire life. In truth, her life is her dharma. She lives right in the center of it. The problem is that she has not named it or claimed it or defined it and therefore feels like she's not doing it on purpose, so it can't really be a calling. This is pure and simple denial of what is evident to everybody else in her life. One last way that doubt can keep us paralyzed that some people may resonate with is called the problem of aim. 
In order to share this idea, Stephen Cope spoke about Father Brian. Now, Father Brian is a Roman Catholic priest. When he was young, he went to seminary in Boston and committed to the priesthood. He knew that he had a vocation, a stirring that first began when he was early in his high school years. Now, however, he is 43 years old, and he knows a little bit more about who he really is. He now says that he might have been slightly confused about his vocation. He does really, really love the church, but he now realizes that what really gets him up in the morning is the music of the church. He has a beautiful Irish tenor voice and knows that he would really rather be in the choir or directing the choir or playing the organ rather than being behind the altar. He almost made it to the center of his vocation, but not quite. He lives in proximity to his dharma, but not in the passionate center of it. If we can see ourselves in this example, then we're probably lying on the floor of our chariot in the ballpark, but not really living our dharma. All of us listening today might be wondering if a life of certitude is actually possible. Stephen Cope says Krishna teaches that it is. But the key to living a life true to Dharma is a complete understanding of and respect for doubt. Indeed, the only way to get to certitude is to look more and more deeply into our doubt, to shine a light into the dark corners of our self-division. So let's take a look at that first pillar, look to the Dharma. Prince Ar Ar Arjuna's uh, Dharma was prescribed for him. In the uh, caste system of ancient India, roles and dharmas were prescribed at birth. So Arjuna was born into the warrior class, so he was destined to become a warrior. It was his sacred duty to fight a just war. He never really had any choice in the matter, nor was his dharma based on any particular personal qualities. We live in a, a very different culture today in which there is emphatically a personal self and therefore a personal dharma. We may have heard it said time and time again that we can do anything we set our mind to. However, regarding our, our dharma, Krishna would say, mm, not exactly. We can, we can only expect a fulfilling life if we dedicate ourselves to finding out who we are, who we are at our very core, to finding the idiosyncratic seeds of possibility that have already been planted there, that were already went within us when we arrived on the planet, the unique, individualized expression of God that we are. Thomas Merton says, Every man has a vocation to be someone, but he must clearly, but he must understand clearly that in order to fulfill his vocation, he can only be one person himself. I'll add herself. The bottom line is that there is something within each of us, a, a divine spark, a divine urge that is waiting to be birthed, unleashed, or let loose, that not only makes our hearts sing, but also brings our sacred work, our dharma, into form. We are each called to live a holy, fulfilling life, and we actively live this as we move in the direction of this divine urge. We each exist and come into being so that the divine spark, the divine fire, the divine impulse, the divine creativity may be consciously expressed and not limited. We are uniquely poised to express our special gifts, our special talents, and our strengths in only the way, in the way that only we can do it. It is the call of life seeking to express itself in new, fresh ways, and we are tasked 
with answering the call with no limitations. So, you know, how can we do this? How do we discover the magnificent blueprint that is within us? How can we work out the realization of our true selves and the discovery of our own particular dharma? Stephen Cope says that there are three important principles that can be found deep in the center of Krishna's teaching for discerning the hidden and at times inscrutable dharma within us. These are trust in the gift, think of small as large, and listen for the call of the times. Trust in the gift, think of small as large, and listen for the call of the times. Gifts. Each one of us has them. Each one of us arrived on the planet with them. They are very real, unique to each and every single one of us, and remarkably easy to identify even from a very early age. If asked, any of us could quite possibly name the gifts of most of the people that we are close to in our lives. Often, when we were very young, we were drawn to something, singing or dancing, dancing, tinkering with our toys, taking them apart and putting them together again, compassionately supporting our friends or perhaps some deep connection with animals, some deep empathy for them. Energetically, we may have known, even at that very early age, that there was something important, something significant about these yearnings, but we really had no language about which to describe that. And we had no really, we really had no ability to nurture them on our own. Stephen Cope says, children cannot understand the full import of the gift. They can only feel their spirit leap up toward the object of interest, can only feel the delightful energy of fascination and enthusiasm. The full impact, import of the gift had to come from our parents or from our siblings or from our extended family or from our friends or from our teachers. But in reality, it, it really only would take one person. But the moment must not pass by unnoticed. That spark in the eye has to be noticed. That, you know, that quickening of the heart has to be seen and acknowledged and supported. We must be uh, encouraged to identify with our gifts. Some of us had that kind of support, and we were able to begin to nurture and to expand upon our gifts at that very early age. He talked about... Um, Oh, my man, now I'm having a brain fart. The, the woman who's big into chimpanzees. Uh, Goodall, Jane Goodall. Yeah, he talked about her, that she had this spark for animals. Like when, when she was four, she sat in a chicken coop and waited for like four hours to watch the chicken lay the egg. And she came out of that chicken coop all like excited and stuff, and her mother saw that spark in her eye and immediately began to acknowledge that and to support that. And so from that very early age, she was beginning to already live the Dharma that she lived out through her entire life, right? So, but for some of us, the, these things may have been just kind of smiled at or maybe mildly indulged, but certainly not encouraged and, exp and supported like the authentic doorway into possibility of a really fulfilling life that they really are, those gifts. They're this possibility into a really filling life, but they have to be acknowledged and supported. We may not have been supported to actually see those gifts as our deep and abiding connection with the divinity within the gift was not nurtured and, in fact, at times was often unknowingly, not viciously, but unknowingly run roughshod over. While we probably didn't know it at the time, this may have been the beginning of our doubt. Our connection, our faith, our trust in the gift, especially at this very early age, is very fragile. It is vulnerable to all types of disruption. The good news, however, is that the gift itself is indestructible. 
Krishna says, fire cannot burn it. There is something resilient about our gifts. Their light is never fully extinguished. However, while it can be done, reclaiming and embracing the gift at midlife can be a little bit complicated. Often, reclaiming it can come with regret or grief for lost opportunities. As we get older, the more difficult it can become to make the commitment to the gift. Other commitments have to be relinquished. Space has to be made, and, you know, there's no guarantees. So there's no way around it. Our Dharma involves, at some point, a leap off of a cliff into the dark. So the invitation is to choose to take the leap no matter what our age is. To understand this idea of think of the small as large, let's go back to Ellen, our uh, VA psychiatric nurse. Now mu much of Ellen's muddle about was in her thinking about her dharma. She thought that her job, her calling was too small. It didn't match up to her fantasies of what a calling should be. Some of her thinking, no doubt, was really um, validated by the views of our culture regarding nursing. Caretaking roles are not always highly respected by our society, and nurses are often taken for granted, although certainly not recently. <laughs> But Ellen's problem started long before her nursing career. Ellen's father was a harsh disciplinarian. He often told her that his harsh discipline was in her best interests, for her own good, and said that it was part of a grand strategy to help her make of her life a great work of art. So this young woman didn't have a prayer. Nursing, for which she was in every single way suited, did not, in her eyes, really qualify as a great work of art. So Ellen remained split between big ideas and what seemed to be an unacceptable, smaller reality. For obvious reasons, Ellen could not embrace who she actually was, so she lived with doubt, sometimes unsure about what otherwise could have been embraced as an immensely satisfying vocation. Through her father, she came up against two of the enemies of Dharma, grandiosity and its flip side devaluing. Grandiosity and devaluing both represent unrealistic uh, thoughts about uh, possibility. Stephen Cope says, Each one of us has, at some point, been caught like Ellen between the twin perils of grandiosity and de devaluing. On one hand, we secretly daydream about being famous, being glamorous, being renowned for some great work. On the other hand, we fear that our small lives, such as they are, don't amount to a hill of beans. So there they are, the devil, grandiosity, and the deep blue sea devaluing. They are both unhappy ways to live. What is really the right size for our life, for our dharma? Not too big, not too small. A little bit like Goldilocks. Lastly, we cannot look at the gift only for uh, its own sake. The gift ha cannot reach maturity unless it is used in the service of the times, unless it is used in the service of a greater good. In order to ignite the full power of Dharma, the gift must be put into service. In the Bhagavad Gita, Prince Arjuna finds his dilemma calling him to the center of the greatest cataclysm of the age. It is no accident that the authors of the Gita place their hero at the exact center of the suffering of the times. It is precisely 
Prince Arjuna's offering of himself to the urgent call of the moment that will turn his gifts into world transferring, world transforming dharma. Stephen Cope says dharma is born mysteriously out of the intersection between the gift and the times. Dharma is a response to the urgent, though often hidden, need of the moment. Each of us feels some aspect of the world's suffering acutely. It tears at our hearts. Others don't see it or don't care, but we feel it. And we must pay attention. We must act. This little corner of the world is ours to transform. This little corner of the world is ours to save. Perhaps what is happening in the world today is the right and perfect storm to call forth the dharma, our dharma, our individual call to be of service, into service for, to the times, to the greater good, to the whole of the society or to the whole of life in some unique and individualized way. The invitation is to choose to willingly step into it wholeheartedly. And so it is. And so it is. Please turn within. As I close my outer eyes and I turn my attention inward, I am acutely aware of the presence of the divine within me and surrounding me. I recognize it as the one heart, the one life, the one mind, the one creative energy back of everything that there is. I call this power and presence God, but it goes by many names. In the Hindu tradition, Krishna. I know that it is who and what I am at my very core, that there is a spark of it within me, that I am a hologram of it, that right where I am, this presence is in its fullness and in its wholeness. And just as I know that this is my truth, I know that it is the truth of each and every person in this room, each and every person within the sound of my voice, each and every person in our community, in the world and beyond, each and every sentient being on the planet. And it is from that place of unity that I speak these words about and for each of us today, truly knowing that we are spiritual beings having a human incarnation that we arrived on the planet imbued with a purpose, with a dharma, with a calling, with something that we are to bring forward in our own unique and individualized ways. I know that without us doing so, it will not appear, it will not be brought forward. that it is something significant and important to the world. And so what I claim is ease and grace for us around recognizing what that is, defining it, claiming it. Not too big, not too small, but just right. Knowing that it is the right and perfect thing for each of us. I claim ease and grace around bringing it forward, truly standing in it powerfully. I know that as we do so, we change the world. We bring to it that which is needed, shine a light on some particular issue that needs healing. I know that we can move through our doubt, call it out, own it, heal it.
and allow ourselves to be all that we were created to be without any limitations because in truth in spirit there are none and who we are is that spirit and I'm so grateful to know this truth and to speak these words so grateful for the power of prayer knowing that these words are loosed into a law that only ever says yes that my words are clothed in form even as they are spoken and so I speak them and release them with love and gratitude and full expectation of their manifestation letting go and letting God be God I invite everyone to anchor this prayer for themselves and for each other for our community and for the world simply by saying and so it is amen it is now time for our conscious giving the Triangle Center for Spiritual Living is sustained by the giving of our time, talent, and treasure. This is the time every week when we offer financial support to assist this community to be a beacon of light and love for ourselves and others. Together we affirm the truth that today's offering lifts this spiritual community, prospers the one giving, and contributes to the experience of sufficiency of the world. Please repeat after me, I am grateful for all that I receive. I am grateful for all that I may give. And so it is. So on the screen right now, there uh, should be the text to tithe number, and you can use that. Or if you would prefer, you can go to our website at trianglecsl.org, and up in the upper right-hand corner, there is a give button if you click on that you will be able to um, uh, give to our community. I am so very grateful for each and every one of you and for the gifts of your time, talent, and treasure. Thank you. And so it is. It is now my pleasure to welcome back up to the stage the awesome Miles and Letha Costin. While Miles is getting tuned up there, um, this next song that we'll sing for you is called What More Could You Want? And uh, to me, it has a lot to do with our own journey and personal choice. And so... It takes what it takes to learn what you gotta learn. Sometimes it's gotta break before it gets returned. Freedom's what you find when you drop the fear that you're gonna get burned. What more could you want? 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 It wasn't a mistake. It was just the push you needed. And that seeming heartache really stopped the bleeding. When you finally awake and you find a truth you can believe in. What more could you want? 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 In a world where you are ruled by your perception In a world where your soul can never be tied down In a world where endings are beginnings In a world where your perception you're in charge of your direction it wasn't a 
mistake It was just the push you needed And that seeming heartache really stopped the bleeding When you finally awake And you find a truth you can believe in What more could you want? 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 What more could you Thank you so much. So in these times, uh, you may find that uh, things may be tough, or at the same time, you may be finding the blessings in all of this. If you want to share those blessings with us, or you would like us to support you in some way, please uh, reach out to us. And you can do so by going to the website at trianglecsl.org. And in the home page, there is a button in the upper corner for you to fill out a prayer request. If you click on that button and fill in the request form, we'll get that prayer and we'll send it out to all of our ministers and to all of our practitioners. And we'll be praying for you throughout the week. So in the comfort of your own home, please stand for our May affirmation. This is a call and response, so please repeat after me. I am grounded in the power and presence of life itself. I am grounded in the power and presence of life itself. It is from that place that I move. It is from that place that I move. I practice my gift of freedom by listening to my higher self. I practice my gift of freedom by listening to my higher self. I completely trust the process. Today, I answer the call to discover, liberate, and express my divine genius. Today, I answer the call to discover, liberate, and express my divine genius. I trust and allow the divine wisdom within me to guide my choices. I trust and allow the divine wisdom within me to guide my choices. I follow its lead. My life is the life of the divine made manifest. Spirit works through me in wonderful ways. My hands are the hands of God. I use them in service to the world. And so it is. All right. So I invite you to turn within, but... Please stay around for our final closing song after I speak this word of benediction. Just coming from a space of going back to this awesome presence that I felt at the beginning of our service, knowing that it is moving through all things, that it is the great orchestrator of all good things, and that it knows how to perfectly move the universe in perfect timing so that what we put into the law becomes. So I'm grateful to know this truth. I'm grateful for each person that has been listening, for everyone here. I'm grateful for all of the blessings to come in our lives this week and know that this river of peace that flows through our lives is accessible to all of us. And so it is. <laughs>